please welcome Representative Carol Alvarado. Good morning. Good morning. Who is here despite the fact that she's got amendments on, a bill, on the bill that's <laughs> going to be on the floor today. So, you know, we're very lucky for her to come. And so we're going to chat for a while. Uh, Representative Martinez, or Rodriguez is going, to, is going to join us. And Representative Alvarado may have, to, may have to leave sort of in the process of that. So we're going to whip on through this. Okay. So thanks for coming. Oh, very, glad to be here. Appreciate it very much. Um, you know, one of the things that the kids here are doing is, is learning about leadership and trying to sort of look into the, the, the future in a way. Uh, could you tell them a little bit about how you got engaged with public service, kind of the path you took? Sure. First of all, good morning and thanks for inviting me. My name is Carol Alvarado and I represent a district in the east end of Houston. The east end of Houston is its very much like the east, <laughs> east side of, uh, of Austin. But I grew up um, in a you know, lower to middle income neighborhood and I think a lot of the reason that I struck up wanting to be in public service was because where I grew up. I grew up where there were a lot of environmental issues and I felt like we were getting the short end of the stick on a lot of things. You know, no parks and the streets were bad and um, we had ditches and no sidewalks. So I think um, being exposed to all of that and seeing some of the injustices and some of the unfairness and some of the discrimination uh, mostly when it came to the environment, um, a lot of chemical companies in our in our neighborhood, and they were just polluting the heck out of us without any kind of explanation. And so I got involved and started um, engaging in, in local politics and the Democratic Party and um, started volunteering, helping candidates that ran for office. So if anybody is out there thinking that they want to run for office, I suggest that you do uh, a campaign. You go out and volunteer in a campaign because it, it will make you a better candidate, it will make you a better office holder if you know what it takes. It's, it's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get uh, to, this, to this place because you have to get out there and basically sell yourself, sell your message, and it takes money. So you have to go out and raise money and meet a lot of people, knock on a lot of doors. I'm a firm believer in grassroots politics, even though we're in the cyber space age where everything is done on the internet, and I, I still believe that you have to reach out and, and touch people face to face and let them know that you are there to listen to what their concerns are. So you started doing a, a sort of community-based environmental was kind of the things that, right. that triggered your, your involvement. What do you think is really interesting you and driving you now? Oh, there are so many things right now. Well, our state is in a, in a flux, and some people don't want to admit that our state is in a flux um, because they help to contribute to make it what it is. And we have a lot of issues dealing with our budget. We, I don't know if y'all been keeping up with it, but we had to cut $4 billion from our school finances. And that's a lot of money. And I'm irritated because we have, Six billion, a little over six billion, sitting in a savings account called the Rainy Day Fund, and I'm of the belief, me and 48 other people, <laughs> are of the belief that we ought to tap into that money to fully fund our schools. I'm concerned about the future. Y'all are already here, but there are so many others that we have to be concerned for to make sure that they have a good environment to to learn in and to reach their fullest potential. So as a result of some of these cuts, unfortunately, you may get hit with some of those because college tuition may go up and it's been going up. I know y'all know that and your parents know that. So those issues, um, immigration's been a big issue, a big topic that is, I think, very near and dear to many of us here, whether we were born here or not. Um, our families all came from someplace else, another country. And it's, it's unfortunate because I think people have used um, our community, the Latino community, as a, as a political piñata. And they have been beating the heck out of us on immigration issues. And uh, Dr. Henson was just telling us about one that happened yesterday in the Senate. And so it's, there's so much hate out there. And it's, it's surprising because you would think that here we are in 2011, that a lot of those issues have died down and people are more accepting. And, I can't help feel the opposite, and this session has proven that, and I think women have taken a big hit. Um, there have been a lot of cuts to women's health, um, health initiatives. So those are the things that, that keep me engaged, that keep me 
um, wanting to do more and to come back next session, because we're in a special session right now, but it, it makes me want to go out there and tell people what's happened here in our state and what we can do to change it. Uh, the students have heard from a lot of the speakers and certainly a lot of the people they've been talking to about how education contributed to people's career development and how it op created options. Can you talk a little bit about the choices you made in sure, education? Sure, sure. I graduated, my undergrad and graduate from the University of Houston. I did a um, majored in political science and then an MBA afterwards. And it's, it is necessary. It is necessary for anything you're going to do. And I know, you know, it, it's fun and you, you make friends, but you really take advantage of this time and learn, absorb everything that you can because this information stays with you and believe it or not it is very useful and will determine how successful you are you're at a wonderful university i wish i could have come here i just didn't it couldn't couldn't get it together but i went to a great university but you're you're lucky to be here and uh, you're part of a, a rich tradition in Texas, so make the most of it. And though you know, we we love it here. University of Houston is really developed Absolutely. as a, tier, as, as a um, university. making its way to tier one now. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I think while we're waiting for Representative Rodriguez, I, what I'd like to do is give you guys a chance to, to ask uh, Representative Alvarado a question or two, because sure. I know that they're all working on policy exercises, okay. and they're all, you know, many of them, I think, are increasingly thinking about public service. So we're going to bring the mic, and I'd like to open it up for questions. Houston delegation? Oh, here we go, right over here. And remember to introduce yourself and say where you're from. Hi, I'm Annalisa Cantu, and I'm from Brownsville, Texas. Okay. So our policy group, which is pretty much this table and another one somewhere around here, we're working on education. And just as your living environment affected you, we're working on how a learning environment affects a student, as well as the curriculum. You know, we feel that maybe Texas' standards have lowered. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about curriculum, how standards have lowered, and how do you think it could be changed? I think we have uh, lowered the standards, and we are now, we think we rank number 44 in terms of what we spend per child in education, and that's nothing to brag about, but the environment in which a student learns in is, is very important. If you're in a classroom, I mean, it works for college, but it doesn't work when you're in, in um, you know, primary and secondary education to have a classroom with 40 kids. And that's what's going to happen because of these cuts. Teachers are having to, to be laid off, and the curriculum has changed. I, I'm a big advocate for health, wellness, and fitness, and I've been trying to get PE, physical activity, back into the curriculum, and also for kids to learn about nutrition, the food that they eat, because I think you make better choices because we not only have to have a, a smart uh, student body coming up, but we also have to have a healthy one. If we have kids that are smart, but they're, you know, they have diabetes or they're overweight or they're, they're just not making healthy choices, then you know, that's, that's a concern for our future leadership of the state. So the environment in which a child learns in is, is very important. Yes. Down here in the front. Hi, I'm Sarah Hi. from Dallas, and I just would like to ask you what, in your opinion, has gone wrong with the education and the, the money stuff, issues? Well, I think for a long time, prior to me getting involved in state politics, there's always been some discrepancies with the formula that's used to, to fund our schools. So there's still some inequities uh, with school districts around the, the state and every session the lawmakers come in and say this is the most important thing that we have to solve is is the formula for our education system and every session it, it you know we make a little bit of progress but it's been more challenging this time because of the the budget situation and we have some things that are contributing to our structural deficit that we're not paying enough attention to it's it's like at your house if you have a foundation that's that's not strong and you've got some holes in it 
and you keep building around it, but you don't fix what's causing the, the main uh, problem in, in, the, in the foundation. So we have yet to take, to take that on. Um, as you all know, the economy in general is, is in a flux. And so we, we feel it here. Um, the unemployment rate is, and job growth is, is um, very stale at this point. So we have to, but as a state, we have to look for ways to increase revenues. What I tell people is if you are a family and you are, you're broke, you are out of work, but you have a savings account, so naturally you're going to dip into that savings account. But you also look for ways to bring more income in. Maybe somebody takes a second job or something, or you sell things. You, you look for ways to bring more money in, and we're not doing that. We're a state that's growing dramatically, which is why we're getting four new congressional seats. We're the only state in the whole nation that is receiving more than two congressional seats. And it's all because of our explosive growth, 89% of our growth being uh, minority, 65% of that being Latino. So for example, I was for gaming. I think that is a, a good revenue stream. We have a lot of Texans that go to Louisiana to gamble. And I think if we had ca you know, casinos here, nice casinos that, that would create jobs and, and stimulate the economy, that would put money back into our, our uh, state. Also, I had a proposal to increase the cigarette tax because we are spending $1.6 billion on costs related to Medicaid cases because of smoking. And so I, my uh, initiative didn't go anywhere, um, but I'm going to stay on it because it would have brought in $750 million over the next two years. And we have all sorts of information that shows, especially with, with young kids, that would probably not take up smoking because it's too expensive. Uh, you're not the first speaker to, to be on this stage in the last couple days and talk about the need for education and yet the fact that there's money in the rainy day fund, there are other sources of revenue that there doesn't seem to, to be the will to approve. Is there, a, is there a problem with attitudes about education in the state? I, I would hope not, but I'm starting to be convinced that, um, that people just, they don't want to make it a priority. They talk the good talk when they're campaigning. Oh, I'm an advocate for education. Education is the most important thing. But actions speak louder than words for me. And I don't see the type of actions that make me uh, believe that the, the leadership in this state, education is a priority for him. And I don't see that. Um, you know, lip service is great. <laughs> sounds good on a campaign. Sounds good on a soundbite and a political ad. But what are you doing about that? If you are the party in control, what are you doing to advance education? I don't. It, it's you know, it's almost gotten to be embarrassing that our where we are compared to other states. And I'm concerned about the future workforce. Okay, over here. Hi, my name is Michelle, and I'm from Houston. Oh, good. Um, we're working <laughs> on a policy project, and it's about immigration. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think about the DREAM Act? And what do you think could be a solution for all the Hispanics that are trying to get a higher sure. education? I think the DREAM Act is a wonderful thing. And it's too bad that our two senators from Texas one that has the fastest growing Latino population did not vote for it. Um, I think immigration does need to be resolved at the federal level. There were, oh, well, later this week, we'll be taking up sanctuary cities, which is just a terrible policy because it gives the um, police officers the authority just to stop anybody for probable cause. And how, well, you know, that's open to interpretation. Uh, maybe you know you're driving a car that looks like you could be an immigrant, and they find some reason to pull you over, and they can question your citizenship there. Uh, I was on the city council in Houston, and our policy was you would inquire about somebody's citizenship once they were arrested and booked in a jail. 
And that's, I think that's a great system. We had a great relationship, still do, with ICE. And that's the way it should be. I'm concerned that um, this is going to cause an uproar in the community. I think, um, I think it's important for the community and police officers to have trust in one another. And I think this is going to, to break that trust. And it's taken so long, um, especially in communities where you've had issues of police brutality or incidents with police officers. And we've worked so hard to overcome that. And I think this is one policy that is uh, it's a misplaced priority. It's, it's because somebody's running for a higher office that they felt this was something they needed to do. So I hope we're able to convince our federal lawmakers to secure the borders and to let the federal government handle that. Over here. I was wondering how you would prioritize the issues facing Texas right now or the nation between education, the environment, immigration, health care, and the economy. I think the economy is first because it's what makes everything else work. So the economy is one, and I would say education is second, um, because we, we have to be competitive, not just within our own state and within our own country, but globally we have to be competitive. And if we're not, um, I mean, we were seen as the most powerful nation, the most educated, the most advanced, and now we're getting surpassed by so many other countries because they invest more in education. So I think those are the, the two biggest issues. Okay, one more. I see Representative yeah, Rodriguez I mean, outside, so we'll switch out. you guys out. Okay, good. Okay. Hi, my name is Amanda. I'm from Laredo, Texas. Um, I'm wondering, uh, what do you think it would take to um, tap into the rainy day fund and grant it to education, like you said? I'm all for that. I wish our governor felt the same way. Um, it is mainly, I mean, I'll be quite honest with you, it is, it is he who has been directing members of his party not to tap into the rainy day fund. I think it's irresponsible. It's... Uh, it's political pandering, and it's, it's unfortunate because our kids are the ones that lose. Our kids pay the price, and it's unfair. We live in a great state, a beautiful state, but we have got to pay more attention to education and make it a priority. Hey, hey I'm gonna have to, we're gonna switch off here. Okay. okay, so with that, we're gonna switch gears. Please okay. thank Representative Carol Alvarado. Thank Before, before I go, let me again thank you for, for being here and thank you for listening to what I have to say. I hope that um, there was something that struck a chord with you, that there's something that makes you want to enter public service. It doesn't necessarily have to be elected office, but if you want to run for office, great. We need more young people running for office. But don't forget what I said. Get out there, find a campaign to volunteer in, and learn what it takes to, to be effective and to win. So thanks. Have a great day. Is that, thank you very much. Okay, with that, we're now doing this sequentially. So I'd like to uh, welcome Representative Eddie Rodriguez from Austin. Uh, with the Austin contingent isn't going to do any of this woo-woo. You're getting kind of outdone by the Houston folks, I just want to say. Uh, there's probably more Houston yeah, folks here than Austin. <laughs> There you go. All I'm right. Actually, I'm actually from McAllen in the Valley. Is anyone from the Valley? <laughs> Everywhere I go, there's some people from the Valley. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Is he good or what? He got two. <laughs> um, well, we started by asking, uh, th thanks a lot for coming. I know you guys are super sure, busy, sure. and we'll, we'll get you back to the floor. Um, we started by asking uh, Representative Alvarado how she got started in public service, kind of what her trajectory was. So we'll ask you the same thing. Well, it's a... Uh, for me, it started when I was fairly young. I was probably in middle school, or it was called junior high when I was when I was there. Uh, junior high, and I was really, I really started getting into uh, uh, politics by watching a documentary about Martin Luther King, and uh, it just it just fascinated me. And uh, from you know from that, I saw you know MLK, and then I, from there, you know, you get to John F. Kennedy, and then you get to LBJ, and you get to, and I just started reading up on MLK, and then Cesar Chavez, and I just I just kind of just got into it that way. Um, and then I just, you know, from there I just kind of 
took off in the sense that I, I didn't know I wanted to run for office necessarily, but I got I had a love for politics and I had a love for uh, for government and all of that. And so uh, when I went to, to college, I went to St. Mary's University for a couple of years before I transferred to UT. Um, you know, I was I was a government major, and then a poli sci major here. And we love that, really. Uh -huh. Yeah, I loved it. It was great. Uh, so you know, it's just it's just something that I can't even I can hardly remember when it started. I don't even know how old I was that really when it happened. But it was it was something that I always just kind of felt, which is really weird because I didn't have anybody in my family who was in politics at all. I mean, there's no one really. I think I had like an uncle who was a judge or something. He was like my dad's second cousin or something like that. You know, but it was not it was not in in the family. Really. Right. So it was just one of those things where I got started. And you know, when I was at, at St. Mary's, I was a, a, a freshman senator, you know, I ran for that. And you know, uh, UT, once I got to UT though, that was all on hold because I, my largest class at St. Mary's was 20 students. My first class at UT was 300 students and it was a biology class. I mean, it just blew me away. And so uh, no more big fish in a little pond kind of thing. It was a small fish in a big pond when I got to UT. And so I kind of was on hiatus for a while and then, um, just kind of just picked it up again in, in, in 1996, before all y'all were born, and um, started working on Bill Clinton's campaign in South Texas, and I was doing that, and that kind of got me back into it. And then you, and then, and then after that, what did you do? Because didn't you? Well, yeah. Then I worked. Uh, you know, I worked at the Capitol. Something I always thought I wanted to do. So I, I worked for a state representative. I was his chief of staff for uh, like five and a half years or so. And then he got redistricted out, which is what we're going through right now is redistricting. And, and back, uh, that was in 2000, um, 2001, I guess. And so he got paired with two other House members in, in, here in Austin. And I, uh, he didn't want to run again. And so I said, well, I'll give it the old Longhorn try and ran. There were six of us running in the primary and I made it through that. And I've been there since 2003. Um Talk about the issues that are kind of driving you right now and that are really on the, on the front burner. The, the students are working on policy exercises where they, through the application process, they chose problems that were important to their community right. and are now working on analysis and proposals for that that they'll be presenting to the Capitol on Thursday. Um, talk a little bit about what's out there issue-wise that really seems important to you. Well, you know, I think I'm sure Carol mentioned it. You know, the budget is, is really big right now. Um, but I'm not going to talk, I guess I can talk about that, but I want to talk about some other issues. Because the thing is, that's going to, unfortunately, until we fix some major, like, fundamental problems, you know, we're always going to have this, this kind of shortfall problem. Uh, it just happens to be really bad right now. But we did some things in 2003 and 5 with our tax system that's going to always keep us in this, pro keep us in this situation where we're going to be short every year. And it, it's, it's a really big, it's, it's really unfortunate. Um, it's just one of those things where um, under, under the guise of, of property tax cuts, we've put ourselves in a hole. And, and I don't see us getting out of that until we have some dramatic changes, not only in the governor's office, but you know, just all around. We, gotta, we have to really fix that problem. But the things that I, so not to talk about something that's so grand, but some things that, that are important to me, um, I've, I've always been a strong proponent of affordable housing. Um, and that's a big issue for me. And that's an issue that I've worked on ever since I've been in office. Uh, renewable energy is a big issue for me as well. I think that that's, it's harder than you would think to talk about, you know, uh, I had two bills that had to do with plug-in vehicles, electric cars, uh, that didn't make it through. And it's, it's difficult, it's, even for me, I should know this by now, we're, we're an oil and gas state, you know what I mean? I mean, everyone just kind of feels in, that, that's what, that that's what this state's all about. Uh, so, you know, there's this kind of the sense that, that anything that tinkers with that is not, not good policy, but that's not necessarily true. I mean, uh, but, but that's one of the things that I've, because with renewable energy and with, with say, with uh, electric cars and that, you're, you're not only talking about uh, the, a better environment, a cleaner environment, you're talking about a new, new technology, you're talking about a new economy as well. I mean, you know, we have Toyota here in, in Texas and we, you know, I think they're going to start building some other cars here. It's an opportunity for us to, to kind of diversify our economy. And I think that that's, that's really kind of the, the, the direction I want to see us going in is to diversify our economy a little bit. And I see doing that with, with uh, solar especially. I mean, that's one thing that we're not doing in Texas as much as we should be doing in solar. Uh, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to really diversify our economy. And, and so that's another uh, issue that's really important to me as well. As you, as you talk about something like pursuing uh, legislation related to renewable energy, the almost reflexive resistance from oil and gas, it kind of points to something about the way that 
policy proposals work through the process, right? These things rarely get done quickly. Never. Yeah, they're never done quickly. Talk yeah. a little about why that is. Well, I mean, because you have a thing called the lobby. I don't know if you all know what the lobby, <laughs> lobbyists are. It's a big deal. Uh, you know, I'm, and it's another thing that no one really talks about that much because it's not very, it's not very sexy and people don't really understand what it means. But a campaign finance is really, it's, it's a big, big deal. Uh, unlike, like, say, the city council, for example, here in Austin, you have, uh, I think it's a $300 limit on what an individual can give to a, a candidate. I don't have a limit. If someone wants to give me $100,000, they can give me $100,000. And I don't have to take it necessarily, but you know, there's no limit on what I can take, or the governor can take, uh, or- As a campaign know, contribution. As a campaign contribution, yes, as a campaign contribution, <laughs> definitely. Um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, uh, so, so you have, so you have a, an influence there, whether, you know, wh whether we want to all admit this thing or not. I mean, you know, if someone, if it's a, if it's a battle between, say, Time Warner Cable and AT&T, for example, you know, if, if Time Warner if, if Time Warner Cable is giving a lot more money to to representatives and senators, well, they might have a little bit of an edge, no matter how you you cut it. It's just the way it goes, and so that's the reason. Part of the reason why things take so long is because of that influence. So you have you do have outside forces that are wanting to slow some things down, and so and then you also have tradition, and so so you have people that aren't really accustomed or used to a new idea, uh, and there's members that that have been there. I mean, I'm going on 10 years almost. I can't even believe it. Um, you know, there are members that have been there 20, 25 years. You know what I mean? And so they're just like, I've never heard of electric vehicles. What is that? I don't understand that. You know? And so, so, they, so they're, they're slow, to, slow to change. Right. But you know, that has its advantages as well, actually. In the some system's respect. sort of designed that way, right? So, well, plus, you know, we don't meet every year. We meet six months every other year, 140 days every other year. So it's really designed to slow things down. And in some respects, that's a good thing because I don't necessarily trust all my colleagues to be around all the time and make all these policy decisions. I wouldn't be happy with that either. So, in some respects, even the bad things, the way I would, what I would call bad things, they don't make it either because it's just you know, it's things are just meant to be slow and and gradual. It's a pretty fine filter, as it turns out. Right. I think in a lot of ways. I want to open up for questions, but I want to ask you one last thing. Um, there's been a lot of, there's a, a big emphasis in the academy for obvious reasons with these students with, on education. Talk a little bit, and you talked about going to St. Mary's, going to UT, and you know, I know that you're in the final stages of, of another educational step. Talk a little bit about your educational decisions and how you decided what and when. Well, for me, and this is for those of us from the Valley that are here, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't wait to leave. I just wanted to experience life outside of my home, you know. And so school was always uh, something that was a, was, was a focus for me and also for my, my, my parents, was to, you know, you're not gonna be able to succeed unless you, when you move on. And so I kind of uh, just took that to heart at a very early age, and I knew that I was gonna go, go off to school. I mean, you, know, you have a university in, in, in the Valley, but I just knew that I wanted to experience something else. Uh, so for me, it wasn't a choice at all, it was just, you know, it was one of those things when I was, a, I think, a, even a junior or even a, maybe even a sophomore in high school, I was looking into different schools and, and figuring out what I wanted to do. Uh, I chose St. Mary's for a couple of reasons. I, don't, I hope I'm not getting too... Di no, too, no, it's great. Too, uh, I, I chose St. Mary's because I went to... I, I checked it out. My mom was from San Antonio, and so I you know, always saw the school. I liked the idea of having a smaller school. Uh, what happened was I didn't have any friends there that I went to, to high school with, right? So a lot of my friends were here at, at UT, and so I said, well, this is different and a lot cheaper. UT used to be cheap. I don't know what it's like now. I don't think it's very cheap now, but... It's still cheaper than St. Mary's. It's still cheaper than St. Mary's, I'm sure. And so I came over here, and I, you know, it, it was... Uh, to me, it was one of those deals where if I actually had any dream of anything that I really wanted to do in my life, I just knew that I had to go to college. It was just not even... An, uh, uh, you know, there was no second guessing that. Um, so I hope that answers your question. I, yeah, you know, it, it was just one of those things where I felt like I really needed to do, and I did have a good support system at home, which I think a lot of, you know, it's, it's difficult, and I was the first in my family to go to school, you know, but it's difficult because uh, that's not always the case. Not, not everybody has that support system at home, and you can't, you know, I can, I've talked to uh, different high schools in, in my district here in Austin, and you see these kids, and they just, it's, you know, it's foreign to them. The idea of going to school, the idea of having some kind of, that, that expectation, it doesn't, doesn't exist for them. 
Now, and you so, decided to go to law school after you'd become an elected official. Right. Uh, talk a little about that. Well, it's interesting. I, I went to law school. I started in 2006. I was uh, about 10 years older than the average law student, so that was kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> it was hard. You, uh, law school is a difficult thing. I think it's a great education, but it was a difficult, difficult thing. It was, it was this weird thing that pe everyone thought that I understood law because I'm a lawmaker. I have no idea. You know, you're reading cases in law school. You know, you're trying to understand, you know, precedents and, and case law and all that kind of stuff. No idea. So it was a weird thing that you had even professors look at me like, okay, well, you know this. I said, well, no, I don't. <laughs> That's why I'm here, you know, to learn this stuff. So it was pretty interesting. It took me a little bit longer to, to finish up because I, I went through a session during that time. So, but it was a, it was a great experience, uh, great education, law school. Anyone who wants to go to law school here, I, I really do recommend it. It's a great education, whether it's in UT or U of H or wherever it is. Uh, it's a great education. And you're studying for the bar now, so we owe you double thanks for taking the time I'm to come for the see bar us. Now. The little bit of studying this morning. Well, very good. Um, Representative Eddie Rodriguez, I want to open it for questions. Do you want to call? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. We've got somebody with a mic coming. So, okay, let's start over here, and try to again try to keep them as brief as possible. Oh, good morning. Is on. Hello? Okay. My name is Steven Dominguez. I live here in Austin, Texas. Uh, and my question is, you talked about the lack of motivation for students in high school. What could, is a possible, you know, solution to maybe fix that and so they're not bored at school? So they're not bored at school. Well, you know, I think, I think it really takes, uh, you know, a lot of participation from the, from the, the community. It takes participation from not just elected officials, but it takes participation from various aspects, the business community and whatnot, I think that's what's been kind of missing a lot. And I think there's, for example, there's a school here in Austin, uh, uh, Johnson, used to be called Johnson, now it's East Side Memorial High. It was one of the, the first school, one of the first schools to close, technically, and then it reopened. Uh, and I, you know, I just had this love affair with that school because I was there. I mean, I, I was, I would go there even when I was a staffer and talk to kids. And, and then as I became elected official, I would, I would, I, st I still go there just to talk to the kids. You know, I think that that all helps. You know, someone, you know, like whether it's me or someone that's that's invested in the community goes there, talks to them, show them that there's that there's hope. That I mean, that there's a reason why you're doing what you're doing. So, not to, you know, not to simplify it much, but I think that depending on the school, because every school is different. If I went to Austin High School, for example, or somewhere in Westlake, I mean, it's a totally different experience than doing something in East Austin, for example. And so, so what's needed is everything's a little bit different in how you deal with it. But I think when you have, let's say, low-income students and uh, not a history of going to, to college, you don't have a long history or a, long, a, a big support system to continue your education, it, it, it does take uh, the rest of the community to really, to really help out and to participate. And I think that's really what, what we need. It's something that, there's no bill that I can pass to, to make that happen. It has to really, we all have to take responsibility for the education of kids, whether they're your kids or not. And I think that's what really needs to, to happen. Other question? Okay, I'm gonna go over here and then over here. Good morning. Uh, concentrating on the bills that address health and human services, what do you think about uh, many workers without health insurance? And what do you think is a possible solution? Uh, you say workers without health insurance, is that right? Yes. Well, that's a really big problem. I, you know, uh, I'm, I, I'm a supporter of what President Obama has done. I think that that's going to, you know, we haven't quite seen it yet, but I think it, it was kind of geared as something that's going to kind of lay itself out over the course of, you know, two, three, four years. I think that we needed something like that to happen if, at a national level. I think, you know, for, for, te for example, Texas really isn't, hasn't done anything to make sure that people are, are, are insured. I mean, there's nothing that Texas has done to really ins make sure that people have health insurance, for example. I think something needed to happen at the federal level. I think that it may not be a perfect solution, probably far from it, but it's something that was, that was palatable to, to most people that you can, it's, it's a good start. And I think that's what we had to do. I think we had to do something, had something at the federal level. I think that, unfortunately, we have the politics got all into this stuff instead of just really the basic premises, do you think that people should have health care or not have health care? And, and instead, you have this whole uh, debate about whether you know, the federal government should be doing it or the state or whatever, which is kind of silly because the state's not doing it. <laughs> you know, no, very few states are actually doing it. I think that, I think that for, 
for Texas, you know, uh, if you're a state employee, you have pretty good health insurance. Uh, and, and, and that's, so that's a positive thing. So the state's taking care of its, its own people. But I think we really need to see how this lays out at the federal level, what Obama's been doing. And, um, and I think that's going to turn out to be definitely a step in the right direction. So you think it has to start with some kind of it has, to, it start has to start with some kind of mandate to move you towards universal coverage. I agree. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly what I think. Uh, I, I promised you next. I think. <laughs> Hi, I'm Danny McCallum. I'm from Edinburgh, Texas, so I'm pretty close to you. Um, I was just wondering, being from the valley. A lot of our like decisions are to whether to leave the Valley for college or not because we have Pan Am right next to us. But you, you were talking about support behind the kids, and, so, and there's a really big dropout rate in schools now. Were your parents really supportive of you getting out of the Valley and going to college? <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say supportive of me leaving the Valley. They didn't really. My, well, I, you know, have to, my, it was just my father for a long time. My mom passed away when I was fairly young. Uh, so my dad was there. He didn't want me to leave, for sure. But it was one of those things that if I was going to go, he was supportive of, of me doing that. Um, uh, I, you know, I think that the, the, the thing that happens with, with places like South Texas or even Laredo or, or El Paso or other places is you have this brain drain kind of thing. And I know that you may have talked about this at some point or not. I don't know. But you have people that, that leave to go to school and they don't come back. And one of my best friends, her name was Anna, she went to, uh, to medical school and just always wanted to go back home to be a doctor back home. Um, and I remember even when I went to St. Mary's, you know, one of my, my favorite professors was, you know, was a government professor. And he said, if you really care about where, you're, where you come from, you, know, you, you get your education, and you go back and you change where you're, where you're from, if that's what, you know, if you really feel like you, you, you want to do that, you need to do that. Um, I, and I guess I'm guilty of not doing that, to be honest with you. I just fell in love with this city. And I want to do public service, and I want to do public service here. But I think that, that that's, and, you know, and I go to the Valley now. Uh, you know, I graduated in 1989 before all y'all were born. And it, you know, now it's such a different place than it was back in the, in the 80s. You know, there's lots of opportunities. And there's a lot of kids that have a desire to go to school. And there's an expectation, almost, of going to school. And you have a great community college system there. It's just a much different place place now than it was back then. So I think the opportunities are there in South Texas. And I, and I, I really feel like uh, you know, it, it's really an up, up and coming part of the state. I really do. I think that. And uh, so the answer to your question is I got support for, doing, for, for going to school. They didn't want to see me leave home. But yeah, I did. Did you have to sell it much? I mean, I think I mean, there's been a lot of discussion among kids here, and we've had some speakers talking about it. I mean, right. to some degree, I mean, your parents can be supportive, but still need to be sold. Yeah, definitely. You got to make mean, the case a little. I had to make the case. I had to tell him that I had grants, <laughs> that you know that it wasn't going to come out of his pocket. And then I, I did some research, and yeah, I had to sell it a little bit. Yeah, I think it's a common experience. Yeah, I think so. Okay, over here, and then we'll come back to this side. We won't forget about you. You either. <laughs> Try to keep your questions as brief as possible, since we have so many. Yeah, you'll do fine. Okay. Hi, my name is Alexa Edwards, and I'm from Dallas, Texas. And I just wanted to know, the standards of curriculum really wave over our heads. And I know that you and Representative Alvarado talked about the learning environment. But I was just wondering, do you believe that the curriculum, whether at state level or national level, should be lowered to meet students' needs as they have been, or raised to encourage them to do better so that our education improves. That's a that's a really great question. It really is, and I think that I think that there is probably a, a kind of a softball answer to that, and there's the hardball answer to that. And the hardball answer to that is going to be that you can't. I think you have to raise the standards. I mean, I think you just have to. Um, it's it's kind of like I liken it to. You know, I, I did a little bit of substitute teaching at a junior high when I was probably 24 or something like that. The, mo the most horrible experience in my life <laughs> was being a substitute teacher at a junior high. But what I, what I saw was it was, really, it was really incredible what I experienced there in the sense that what, what ends up happening, especially if you're a substitute teacher, so I'm sure when the real teacher was around, and she was on maternity leave, so she was gone for like three months, what ends up happening is, is that everything kind of goes down to the lowest factor. You, you know, the kid that's the, that was the most you know, trouble, let's say, that, that just you know, was always acting up, Everything just kind of ended up revolving around that one or two 
you know, kids. And I just, and I saw in the faces of some of the other students how it wasn't really fair to those kids. The ones that were maybe going to go on and they wanted to, to learn something. And so that's kind of a long way of saying that I think you just, you have to look at where we want our state to be and where our country to be in terms of our education. And so I think if you start with that at that point, then you, then you figure out how, whether that means you have to have hire more teachers, you have to spend more money for educate for, you know, for teachers or, uh, more money on certain curriculum, whether you know whatever it is you have to do, I think you have to start at that point. I mean, the state, you know, we're over 50% minority. I mean, either, either African American or, or Hispanic. Uh, it, Texas is not an Anglo state anymore, and people don't really realize that. And who drops out more, and who gets you know teen pregnancy? I mean, all that stuff. It happens in minority communities, and if you don't address that stuff right away, I mean, you're going to run into a lot of problems. Um, and so, and, and I think that. You know, you have to plan ahead. It's like anything else, and to do that, you really need to see. You want to look to where you want the state to be, and by doing that, I think you need to look at a, at a higher, a higher standard. It's a you know, it's a good point about a lot of policy problems, right? Which is, you know, you can find a kind of anchor solution that seems most, or anchor component of a solution that seems important, but immediately there's got to be a bunch of other things that have to happen. Yeah, you know, it seems to me. Okay, we're gonna go. We're gonna pop back over to this side of the room. Uh, I'm going to go here and then over here. Okay. Hi, I'm Catalina Lizarraga, and I'm from Austin, Texas. I actually go to Austin High. But um, <laughs> uh, my group is doing, um, trying to make a policy on education with regards to our problem is the dropout rate. And we feel that one um, big, um, one thing that influences dropouts is knowledge about college. And we know parent motivation is a big factor in this, but something that cannot really be controlled through a policy. What would be, um, what is one possible solution that can be made through a policy to increase knowledge about college? Um, sure, school? yeah, that's a good question. When I, was in, when I was in high school, we had counselors, and we had like four counselors in my high school. And now you just don't, I, 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 my understanding is, is that first of all, budget's been cut so much, and you don't ha really have a lot of counselors. The counselors were there, you know, just to tell you, I mean, I, you started going to a counselor when you were a freshman in high school to tell you what your options are. So even if you didn't get it at home, you got it at school. And so, and, and, and that is sorely lacking now where you have, if you're even curious as a high school student, that you can go to someone and say, well, what are my options for school? Uh, my high school counselor was telling me what grants I could qualify for, was telling me how to fill out applications when I was a junior in high school to do that. And I know that those still exist. I mean, you still have those, but it's not as common as it used to be. In other words, high school was really geared towards, uh, in some respects anyway, towards if you, your choice of maybe moving on to, to, to college. Now we have a system that's a, where you have a lot of just testing, you know, you just want to, you know, it's all, it's really important to pass you know, certain tests. Everything's geared towards that because funding is, is, is kind of tied into that. And so, you're kind of neglecting, you know, we're not in, you know, it's, it's to the point where you can't just have a high school diploma and expect to, to, to be a great success. Now that's possible. I mean, obviously that's still possible. Thank God, you know, in this country you can do that. It's not impossible. But what I'm saying is your chances are a lot better. I mean, it's proven if you go to college and then if you go to, you know, law school or if you go to graduate school or whatever. But, so, but right now everything seems to be geared towards trying to, to do well on a particular test, and then you just graduate, and then you're not really prepared lots of times. Whether it happens from home or not is, again, it's not a policy thing that I can do or anybody, or Carol Abelardo can do or anybody. So I think that one thing that you can do is to try to, to, to get more, get these counselors back into place and, tell, and make sure kids understand they do have a, they have a choice. Okay, last question over here, and then we'll give you guys a chance to say hello. Let the representative get to legislating. Good morning, my name is Perla Roman and I'm from Houston, Texas. My group is working on immigration and we're looking into the DREAM Act. I was wondering what you think, uh, what's your stand on the DREAM Act and what do you think are some flaws and some virtues of the act? Oh, the DREAM, I'm a strong supporter of the DREAM Act. I really am. Uh, I think, do you say the virtues of and of the DREAM Act? Well, I, th I mean, again, it's like I was, what I've probably been saying all morning here is that, you know, we, if you're going to think about the future of the state, you want to educate people. People need to be educated. 
And it doesn't matter whether you're an immigrant or not an immigrant. If you do well in school and you, you want to go to college, and, and uh, you know, and that's the thing that's so frustrating about, and you know, I, I don't want to get too too overtly political here, but it's frustrating about this environment in, in the Texas House and the Senate is that it's so anti-immigrant. And it's with this complete failure to understand the contributions that immigrants have in this state and this whole country. I mean, uh, taxes are paid. Uh, yeah, there's, there's just, there's a contribution that's made. It's not like, anyway, I can really get on that. I'm not going to. It's very frustrating what, what's going on here. The DREAM Act is a perfect example of how you can do right by people that earn it. And that's really what I thought this state was about, really, and the, the country was about, is if you, you earn, you work hard, you earn it, then you get to move on, you get to do what you want, what you want to do. I think in the absence of something like the DREAM Act, you're punishing people unnecessarily. You're punishing people that are, that are doing everything that they need to do to get ahead in, in, in life and to contribute to their, own, to their own communities, which benefits everybody. So, um, so I'm a, strong, a very strong supporter of the DREAM Act. Okay, you know, you've been waiting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna break my rule. You, you've been very patient and seem to be good natured about it. So you'll be the last one. Hi, my name is Victor Macias and I'm from El Paso, Texas. Um, going back to the, to the solar energy, my group is the, on the, doing a policy on the environment. What do you think about the solar energy? Uh, do you think it'll help uh, Austin and do you think it'll help the whole Texas? Cause we are harming the environment a lot, and I think that using solar energy, I think that like that'll help the environment. Yeah, so definitely. Yes. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it, well, it, it definitely will help the environment. I mean, I mean, it's hot in Texas, man. It's always sunny here in Texas. You know, it makes sense to do it. We have Texas is now number one in the whole country in wind energy. That was something that was promoted, you know, over ten years ago, uh, in, for West Texas, and and Texas leads the country in wind energy. And uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a small chunk, but some of our statewide energy that we use that goes through the grid that has, where it goes to the rest of the state comes from wind energy. And there really isn't any reason why solar can't do the same thing. Plus it has, I think solar has the potential to have an economic benefit as well as an environmental benefit because you have to, you have to manufacture you know, solar panels and, or, or uh, other kind of technologies. Uh, and there's no reason why we can't do that here in Texas. And so you can manufacture it, there's jobs, and then you can install them either in homes or you can have it. Uh, I was driving to South Padre Island a couple weeks ago, and there was a, a right outside of San Antonio, there was a, a whole you know, field full of solar panels just to try to, to, to provide energy for the city of San Antonio. And there's no reason why we can't do that. And Austin's trying to do the same thing, actually. And so uh, I think it has a lot of potential economic as well as, in, as for the environment. From a, policy, from a policy perspective, is there a way to encourage that? Yeah, and we've tried it, and I've tried it for two sessions now, and that, you know, that is to, you have, you have, there are some state monies, uh, but, but the one thing that I try to do is to say that a certain percentage of our state's energy is gonna come from solar, and that's never, that just hasn't passed the last two sessions I've tried it. And ironically though, you know, ironically the wind energy people have been trying to fight that you know, because they've gotten the, the piece of piece of the pie, so they don't want solar to get to get to it. It's kind of ironic, but uh, but it happens. Well, in a way, that's that's what a concrete example of your earlier point about. You know, I mean, you sort of summarized it as the lobby, but people get in there and interests are all fighting. You can stymie. It, it, it can slow down the adoption of solutions right. that, in ways that aren't intuitive, completely. Sure, and the interest of some of the of some of the some of the lobby or whatever is to slow things down. It's very easy to slow things down in the legislative process. It's a lot easier to slow it down than to do it. Right. With that, please thank Representative Eddie Rodriguez. We have a gift for you. Yeah.